Mrs. Joyce, did Mr. Joyce dislike his father? No. Jim loved his father deeply, but he had no illusions about him. He, he let me know very early on what he thought of his entire family. I have it here in his own words. 29th of August, 1904, my dear Nora, I may have pained you tonight by what I said, but surely it is well that you should know my mind on most things. My mind rejects the whole present social order and Christianity, home, the recognized virtues, classes of life, and religious doctrines. How could I like the idea of home? My home was simply a middle-class affair ruined by spendthrift habits, which I have inherited. You know, he never spoke a truer word in all his life. Our story really begins here, in Galway, on the west coast of Ireland. And when I picture Nora now, in my mind's eye, this is where I see her. On a spring morning in 1904, when she left home forever, the daughter of a Galway baker, she had little social standing and even less education. Nora had been seen out walking the previous evening with a young man, a young Protestant man. Throughout her life, she rarely gave interviews, yet a half century later in Zurich, she would remember this incident that had so changed her destiny. <laughs> You see, my Uncle Tommy was very strict. And I had a young boyfriend. <laughs> it was all harmless fun. My Uncle Tommy found out about it, though. Faith, that man could hear the grass growing. He took a stick to me that night. <laughs> I ran away the next day. Did you? Oh, be dad, I did. I ran away to Dublin and I got a job. But I never wanted to set eyes on him again. I guess you couldn't have imagined that within a few months you would meet a penniless young poet. That he would become the most famous writer of the century. Indeed, I did not. That you would become the most important woman in his life and that he'd put you in all of his books. <laughs> what were you thinking of that day? I to tell you the truth. I was wishing that my boots didn't leak. Your name was Nora Barnacle, then. And green as cabbage. <laughs> and that's where you met Mr. Joyce, in Finn's Hotel. Ugh, not at all. I met him walking along Nassau Street one fine June day. then that he was a poet. With his yachting cap and his blue eyes, I took him for a Swedish sailor. Anyhow, nothing would satisfy him until I agreed to make an appointment with them. Well, now that set the Dublin gossips off, I can tell you. Has anyone seen the great writer lately? I hear he's spending his time with a barnacle goose. <laughs> June the 16th, 1904. June 16th. I can't remember. It is nearly 50 years ago, you know. Your husband used it years later as a setting for his novel Ulysses. And he chose it as a tribute to meeting you. Is that a fact? <laughs> but Sir Jim was always attributing importance to all sorts of things. 
<laughs> but you've no idea what it was like for me to be thrown into the life of that man. But you know, could be true what you say. For he told me years later that it was on that day when we first went walking out that I made a man of him. He was 22 years old with a great education. <laughs> uh. But it was very restless and unhappy at home. His family was never the same after his mother's death, and his father, Lord Restum, would drink like air and dry, so that the children were often hungry in that house, I can tell you. You know, the father would often refuse them the money for the housekeeping, and he'd stand on the stairs and he'd shout, I'll break your bloody hearts! I'll break your stomachs first, you buggers! My mother was slowly killed, I think, by my father's ill treatment, by years of trouble and by my cynical frankness of conduct. We were 17 in family. Six years ago, I left the Catholic Church, hating it most fervently. By doing this, I made myself a beggar, but I retained my pride. Now I make open war upon it by what I write and say and do. Can you not see the simplicity which is at the back of all my disguises? We all wear masks. Our friend James the Poet, chasing a chambermaid. <laughs> Poor Jim. His so-called friends were often cruel to him. Vincent Cosgrave, who was always trying to get me to go out with him, pretended to be a great friend to Jim. But behind Jim's back, Cosgrave told me that Jim would never stick with me. Me working as a maid in a hotel and all. Sure, I was the one who did the sticking, Jim would always say. Because my name was Barnacle. <laughs> But Jim could be funny too, you know. Once, once he had me pestered for a keepsake. So I gave him my glove. <laughs> my dear little goody brown shoes. I forgot, I can't meet you tomorrow but will on Thursday at same hour. I hope you put my letter to bed properly. Your glove lay beside me all night. Unbuttoned. <laughs> but otherwise conducted itself very well. <laughs> like Nora. Please leave off that breastplate as I do not like embracing a letterbox. <laughs> do you hear now? She's beginning to laugh. <laughs> My heart. As you say. It's quite so. So you decided to elope with him and get married? Oh, eloped with it all right. But we didn't get married for 27 years. Mr. Joyce would never live in Ireland again. But he was to spend his lifetime writing about his native city, its bars, its brothels, its beaches. In fact, years later, in his novel Ulysses, he made Dublin and its people famous. Don't 
talk to me about Ulysses. It took Jim ten years to write that book, and everywhere it went, it caused trouble. That's the God's honest truth. Do you know, it was banned in America because the authorities thought it would incite people to commit fornication in the streets. Could you credit that now? Of course. I've never been to America, but it must be a very queer place. You were living in Paris, France, when Ulysses was published. That must have been a very exciting place to be in the 20s. I suppose you met a lot of important writers. <laughs> sure, everywhere you'd turn, you'd be tripping over a writer or a painter. Mr. Picasso and Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, André Gide, Marcel Proust, writers. Writers. God preserve us from writers. All that it was sit about to two or three in the morning, drinking and smoking and talking. <laughs> talking and talking until you were bored stiff. And everybody listening to see who'll say something clever. Do you know, the one and only time that Jim and Mr. Marcel Proust ever met, they talked about South American parrots. Oh, no, everyone was very disappointed, I can tell you. And that fellow Fitzgerald, Scott Fitzgerald? <laughs> sure, he was as mad as a hatter. You know, he held my husband in such high regard that he wanted to find some way to show her, so he offered to jump out of a window once for Jim. Indeed. The only one with a head on her shoulders was Sylvia Beach. Of course, she wasn't a writer, no. She was an American. And she had a little bookstore called Shakespeare and Company. And she made up her mind she was going to publish Ulysses, and nothing was going to stop her. <laughs> well, she hunted high and low, and she got turned down, too, all over England and America, and all over France by printers who didn't want to print up any dirty words. She persevered, though, and finally she found in Dijon a printer who liked dirty words. And a year later, in 1922, she launched the book on Jim's 40th birthday. <laughs> and Jim was that nervous he kept his hat on the whole time. Mademoiselle, je vous en prie, venez, je vous en prie, monsieur. Do we all have somewhere to sit? And there's a chair. Miss Tobus need not sit on the floor. Oh, Mr. Hemingway, Mr. Hemingway, would you take those galoshes off the stove, please? Well, melt, dear. Thank you. Bonsoir, monsieur. I think we are about ready. Mesdames, messieurs, friends, Mr. Joyce. <coughs> this is a very special occasion for all of us. Today, we are going to give you two excerpts from the newly born Ulysses. <laughs> Now, as many of you know, Ulysses began its life in print some uh, four years ago when, thanks to the efforts of Ezra Pound, the Little Review in New York started to run it as a serial. Well, all went well until the U.S. Post Office began confiscate copies. And when the Gertie McDowell chapter appeared, it was brought to the attention of the New York Society for the Prevention of Vice. No. <laughs> Well, a court case ensued with the result that uh, publication or sale of Ulysses was banned in any form in the United States. It was then that I approached Mr. Joyce, who had just moved here to Paris from Trieste and requested the honor of bringing out Ulysses in book form under the banner of Shakespeare and Company. Mr. Joyce agreed. Oh. Now... To, uh, to find a printer who would consent to handle such controversial material was the first problem. Well, thank heavens for Maurice Darantier of Dijon. Yeah, well <laughs> then to find a typist who would agree to finish typing the manuscript. Well, the first young lady that I engaged was so shocked at its content that she fainted away over her machine. <laughs> yes, right here in this room. The husband of yet another typist became so enraged that he attempted to throw the only copy of the manuscript in the fire. Oh. But on the brighter side, I am pleased to be able to tell you all that we now have a subscription list of over 2,000 potential customers for Ulysses. Yeah. <laughs> from all over the world. And 
I think I have found a way to get copies of the book past the customs and into the United States. Listen. A separate dust cover will be made for each copy going to America, bearing the inscription, Merry Tales for Little Folk. <laughs> Mr. Hemingway thought that one up. Oh, for God's sake, Sylvia. Yes, you did too, Ernest. Don't be so modest. <laughs> now, to Ulysses itself. Since we are to have two excerpts from it, I think it well to acquaint you with some of its characters. Ulysses is modeled on Homer's great saga and is written from 18 different points of view and in as many styles. The story takes place in the course of a June day in the city of Dublin in the year 1904. It is the story of the happenings in the lives of three inhabitants of that city. Mr. Leopold Bloom, his wife Molly Bloom, and the young poet Stephen Dedalus. Now, Mr. Bloom is every man everywhere a very ordinary humble bumbling jewish advertising canvasser very very ordinary very downtrodden from the moment he gets up in the morning mr bloom's day proceeds from one defeat to another he is painfully resigned to the fact that his wife the half spanish half irish molly cuckolds him <laughs> yes alice who calls him? <laughs> Several times weekly with the swaggering concert entrepreneur, Mr. Blazers Boylan. <laughs> Towards evening, having attended the funeral of a friend, Mr. Bloom finds himself on the seashore where he encounters young Gertie MacDowell. So, before we get to Molly Bloom, I want to introduce all of you to Gertie MacDowell. Gertie, who caused us so much trouble in the New York courts. Gertie, who, like one of Homer's sirens, sits on the rocks and, without so much as touching him, or indeed even speaking to him, seduces our Mr. Bloom and herself into orgasm. <laughs> Quite an achievement, I would have thought. <laughs> well, it made the New York prosecutor mad as hell. <laughs> but what really put the topper on his rage is that Gertie MacDowell is our Mr. Joyce's spoof on the prudery of Victorian young ladies who, according to the New York prosecutor, don't have orgasms. <laughs> and certainly not on public beaches in full view of everyone. Now, picture, if you will, our Mr. Bloom. Holdy, as his wife, Molly, calls him. But who was Gertie? Gertie MacDowell, who was seated near her companions, lost in thought, was in very truth as fair a specimen of winsome Irish girlhood as one could wish to see. And then there came out upon the air the sound of voices and the pealing anthem of the organ. It was the men's temperance retreat, conducted by the missioner, the Reverend John Hughes, S.J., rosary, sermon, and benediction of the most blessed sacrament. How sad to poor Gertie's ears, had her father only avoided the clutches of the demon drink. The twins were now playing again in the most approved brotherly fashion, till at last Master Jackie, who was really as bold as brass, deliberately kicked the ball as hard as ever he could down towards the seaweedy rocks. Poor Tommy was not slow to voice his dismay, but luckily the gentleman in black came gallantly to the rescue and intercepted the ball. Our two champions claimed their plaything with lusty cries, and to avoid trouble, Sissy Caffrey called to the gentleman to throw it to her. The gentleman aimed the ball once or twice, then threw it up the strand towards Sissy Caffrey. But it rolled down the slope and stopped right under Gertie's skirt. The twins clamored again for it, and Sissy called to her to kick it away and let them fight for it. Gertie drew back her foot, but she wished their stupid ball hadn't come rolling down to her, and she gave a kick, but she missed, and Edie and Sissy laughed. 
If you fail, try again, Edie Boardman <laughs> said. Gertie smiled assent and bit her lip, but she was determined to let them see. So she just lifted her skirts a little, but just enough, and took good aim and gave the ball a jolly good kick, and it went ever so far, and the two twins after it. Down at Margate, looking very charming, you are sure to meet those girls, dear girls, those lovely seaside girls. With sticks they steer and promenade the pier to give the boys a treat. In pieces, yes. silks and lace, they tip you quite a playful <laughs> wink. It always is the case, you seldom stop to think. You fall in love, of course, upon the spot, but not with one girl. Always with a lot. Those girls, those girls. It was her he was looking at. And there was meaning in his look. His eyes burned into her as though they would read her very soul. Wonderful eyes they were. Superbly expressive. But could you trust them? People were so queer. She could see at once by his dark eyes and his pale intellectual face that he was a foreigner. The image of the photo she had of Martin Harvey, the matinee idol. Only for the moustache. He was in deep mourning, she could see that. <sighs> if he had suffered more sinned against than sinning, or even, even if he had been himself a sinner. Wicked man. She cared not. Even if he was a Protestant. Or a Methodist. She could convert him. Easily. If he truly loved her. And then the choir began to sing Tantamurgo. And she just swung her foot in and out in time as the music rose and fell to the... Three and eleven she paid for those stockings in Sparrows of Georgia Street on the Tuesday... No, the Monday. ...before Easter. And that was what he was looking at. She swung her buckle shoe faster as she caught the expression in his eyes. He was eyeing her as a snake eyes its prey. Edie Boardman was noticing it too because she was squinting at Gertie, half smiling. A penny for your thoughts. What? Oh, I was only wondering, was it late? Then Edie straightened up Baby Boardman to get ready to go. And it was high time, too, because the Sandman was on his way for Master Boardman, Jr. How moving the scene there in the gathering twilight. And just then, a bat flew forth from the ivied belfry through the dusk, hither, thither, with a tiny, lost cry. Canon O'Hanlon put the Blessed Sacrament back into the tabernacle and the choir sang Laudate Domina Momnes Gentes and Cross Cat Edie asked, wasn't she coming? But Jackie Caffrey called out, Look, Sissy! And they all looked. Was it sheet lightning? But Tommy saw it too. Over the trees beside the church, blue and then green. And purple! It's fireworks! Sissy Caffrey said. Come on, Gertie! It's the bizarre fireworks! But Gertie was adamant. She had no intention of being at their beck and call. And they all ran down the strand, helter-skelter, Edie with a push car with a baby boardman in it, and Sissy holding Tommy and Jackie by the hand so they wouldn't fall, running. At last, they were left alone. And she knew he could be trusted to the death. A man of inflexible honor. She leaned back far to look up where the fireworks were, and she caught her knee in her hand so as not to fall back. And she seemed to hear the panting of his heart. And Jackie Caffrey shouted to look, there was another. And she leaned back, and they all saw it and shouted to look. Look. And she leaned back ever so far to see the fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> 
And she saw a long Roman candle going up over the trees, up, up, and in the tense oh. hush they were all breathless with excitement as it went higher, oh. almost out of sight. And he had a full view, high up above her knee. And she wasn't ashamed, and he wasn't either, to look in that immodest way. And then a rocket sprang and bang, oh. shot. And then the Roman oh. candle burst and it was like a sigh of... <gasps> and everyone cried... <gasps> and it gushed out of it a stream of... Rain, gold, hair, threads, and they shed. And they were all green, dewy, stars falling with gold. And... <gasps> so lively. Oh, so soft. Sweet. So... Then all melted away, dually, in the grey air. All was silent. <sighs> Should a girl tell? No. A thousand times, no. That was their secret. Only theirs. Alone in the hiding twilight, and there was none to know or tell save the little bat that flew so softly through the evening to and fro. And little bats don't tell. Tight boots? No. Oh, she's lame. Night comes to Mr. Bloom's city, and although he still has some calls to make, one to a whorehouse, his thoughts and his steps turn to home and Molly. I ran away to Paris with him, to live in sin. Well, now that was the plan. But as it turned out, we ran away to Trieste and lived in poverty. They've started to quarrel. Uh -huh. Too good to last. We were poor and we were lonely. Jim had a job as an English teacher with the Berlitz Language School, and he didn't make very much money. Everybody spoke either Italian or German or... Serbo-Croatian, and I found it very difficult to converse with people. <laughs> they used to laugh at me in the street in my one old dress. <laughs> you see, I was pregnant at the time, and we didn't have the money for a second dress or a pair of shoes or anything. I remember, I remember I used to cry a lot. Oh, and Jim was writing, writing like there was no tomorrow. He had a half a dozen stories written for a book he was going to call Dubliners, and uh, the novel had, oh, 14 or 15 chapters done. That would have been his first novel, a portrait of the artist as a young man. Aye, but we could never make up his mind what to call it. He had me heart scalded with asking me which title it should have. No doubt you gave him your opinion. Indeed, I did not. I'm sure I never read any of his books. I couldn't understand them. Not everybody can, you know. <laughs> In those days, Jim was always trying to get me to read. He was a great one for studying. German and French and Italian, the devil knows what else. 
for us to get leppin' mad at me when I'd be sitting on the floor, blowing soap bubbles. Faith, I could blow them as big as footballs. You ought to study French, he'd say. For when the novel sells, and we all go to live in Paris. It could be very childish sometimes, you know. Simple-minded Jim. He had a sad face and a voice like an angel. I always wanted him to go on with the singing and give up all that old writing. Always getting him into trouble and ruining his eyesight. I'm well, sure it is true that I had no education and that Jim knew everything. Well, almost everything. He knew nothing at all about women, of course. I got very sick. One afternoon in July, just as he was setting out to go to a bathing place. Well, we both thought it was the heat or something I'd eaten. Indeed. If it hadn't been for the landlady having the good sense to send for the midwife, I don't know how Georgia would have come into this world. <laughs> but come, he did. And Jim was so proud to have a child. Out he rushed immediately with the few pence we had and sent a telegram to his family in Dublin. Sunborn. Mother and little bastard doing well. <laughs> it was most likely Vincent Cosgrave. Devil take him. Spread that rumour in Dublin. Jim would never have written anything so, so vulgar. Never. Besides, he didn't have the money for that many words. Indeed. We didn't have a penny piece between us. Danny. Stanny called himself my brother's keeper. Faith, and he was too. Oh, he was always scolding us for the way we managed money. Or failed to manage it. And it is true that Jim was always borrowing from him. But sure, Jim borrowed from everyone. He was drinking a lot in those days. And I'd never know it. What hour he'd come home. So Stanny, when he came to live with us, used to go down in the evenings and he'd drag him out of the workmen's cafe in the old city. And he'd scold him. Do you want to be going about with a cane and a little dog? Faith, I used to get mad at him too. I'll have your child baptized in the morning. <laughs> I knew that'd get him. No wonder Jim thought of leaving us all at that time. But he didn't. Do you see, he was a kind man. And he couldn't hurt a fly. Wasn't it about that time, Mrs. Joyce, that you gave birth to a daughter? Yes. Lucia. She was born on the 26th of July, 1907, in the pauper ward. Jim had just suffered a terrible attack of blindness and he'd had leeches applied to his eyes to restore the sight. He thought that name might be a good omen. You see, Lucia means light. Now about Lucia, Mrs. Joyce. No. No, we, we won't talk about Lucia. Very well, Mrs. Joyce. In 1909, your husband went back to Ireland for the first time, taking your young son with him. Uh, he so wanted his father to see Giorgio. And at that time, an Irish publisher was interested in bringing out Dubliners. Besides... Jim had a scheme to make a fortune. That man could sell sand in the desert. He persuaded two Italian businessmen from Trieste to open Dublin's first cinema. I bet you didn't know that now, did you? <laughs> yes. The Vault, it was called. Oh, it was very well received when it first opened. Which they only showed Italian pictures. 
so I suppose Dublin quickly got tired of it. That first trip home brought about a crisis in his life. I don't know what you mean, I'm sure. I think you do, Mrs. Joyce. And then he runs into his old drinking companion, Vincent Cosgrave. <laughs> Didn't Mr. Cosgrave have an interesting tale to tell? Not the one about betrayal and infidelity. Vincent Cosgrave hated and envied Jim. He was an idler who was wasting his life and, and he'd never forgotten that I'd turned him down years before in favour of Jim. I understand there was a letter. It was a lie. It was a lie. You were living in Trieste, Mrs. Joyce. She, uh... Letter from Daddy. One for Stanley, too. Forty-four Fontenoy Street, Dublin, 8th of August, 1909. Nora, I am not going to Galway, nor is Giorgio. What? Stanny, he's not going to Galway! I am going to throw up the business I came for. I have been frank in what I have told you of myself. You have not been so with me. What is he talking about? At the time when I used to meet you at the corner of Marion Square, and walk out with you and feel your hand touch me in the dark and hear your voice at the time I used to meet you every second night you kept an appointment with a friend of mine outside the museum he put his arm around you and you lifted your face and kissed him and the next night you met me I have heard this only an hour ago from his lips is Giorgio my son The first night I slept with you in Zurich was October the 11th and he was born July 27th. That is nine months and 16 days. In Dublin here, the rumour here is circulated that I have taken the leavings of others. Perhaps they laugh when they see me parading my son in the streets. Oh, he lost his senses completely this time. Can't he see that they're jealous of him? Are we all to be destroyed by that city? Stanny! Stanny! What did you do about Cosgrave? Oh, days passed. Miserable days. I started to write to Jim a hundred times, but I couldn't. I know now that Stanny wrote to him and told him what a swine Cosgrave was and that it was not true. But it seems that Jim's old friend, John Burden in Dublin, to whom he went in his confusion and trouble, was also ready to defend me, though I scarce knew the man. Today I signed a contract for publication of Dubliners. Don't read over those horrible letters I wrote. I was out of my mind with rage at the time. Nora, darling, I apologize to you humbly it has been a bitter experience and our love will now be sweeter ay that it was a bitter experience but we'd weathered it and tis true what jim said for our love did grow sweeter he sent me this copy of his poems then chamber music, all hand copied by himself on parchment with our initials intertwined on the cover. There's a note in it still. The book of verses is for you. It holds the desire of my youth and you, darling, were the fulfillment of that desire. Tell Stanny to send me a whole lot of money and quickly so that we may meet soon. Do you remember the day I asked you, indifferently, where will I meet you this evening? And you said, without thinking, where will you meet me, is it? You'll meet me in bed, I suppose. I think perhaps he liked the idea of betrayal. I mean, if you consider the letters he wrote you at that time... You understand that... nothing. My husband was a lonely man all his life. We wrote letters, certain kinds of letters to each other, to relieve the loneliness.
My dearest Nora, Dublin is a detestable city and the people are most repulsive to me. I can eat nothing. I am so agitated. My brain is empty. Nora, my true love, you must really take me in hand. Why have you allowed me to get into this state? Will you, dearest, take me as I am with my sins and follies and shelter me from misery? If you do not, I feel my life will go to pieces. Tonight, I have an idea. Madder than usual. I feel I would like to be flogged by you. I would like to see your eyes blazing with anger. I wonder, is there some madness in me? is love madness. One moment I see you like a virgin or Madonna. The next moment I see you shameless, insolent, half naked and obscene. What do you think of me at all? Are you disgusted with me? Are you too like me? One moment high as the stars, the next lower than the lowest wretches. I gave others my pride and joy. To you I give my sin, my folly, my weakness, and sadness. Joyce, why did your husband encourage his friend, Roberto Prezioso, to try and seduce you? <laughs> I'm sure that was Jim's way. <laughs> he had a little notebook. Oh, dear, he had thousands of them that he used to carry around everywhere with him. And he'd write down in it bits and scraps of any old thing that someone would say that would take his fancy. <laughs> He was always at me to tell him my dreams. Ugh, all nonsense. Sure, I'd no interest in Roberto. And I used to let him prattle on when he'd come to visit in the afternoons. I knew Jim was only gathering all that information for some old story or poem or play or something he was writing. Il sole s'è levato per lei. That's what Roberto said to me. The sun shines for you. Well, do you know, somebody told me years later that Jim put that in a book. Which one was it now at all? Ulysses. Oh, why? Tis Molly Bloom says it. The sun shines for you. Well, now, Jim got that directly from me. Oh. I know what you're thinking, so you needn't even ask. Mm. All the interviewers want to know if I was the model for Molly Bloom. Well, I wasn't. <laughs> I was not. She was much fatter. <laughs> Let's go back to Mr. Bloom, whose relationship with his wife has been less than adequate for the past 11 years, ever since the death and infancy of their only son. Rudy? Train somewhere, whistling. The strength those engines have in them, like big giants, and the water rolling out of them on all sides, like the end of love's old sweet song.
when he returns home late that night. He recounts to Molly the events of his day with modification. He does not tell her of meeting the young cripple Gertie McDowell at the beach, nor of his adventures in the whorehouse. Of course, she does not tell him that she has spent the afternoon with her lover, Blazes Boylan. Who will console Mr. Bloom? Ah. In a last-ditch effort to retrieve the day and reinstate his manhood, Mr. Bloom attempts to make love to his wife. Upside down. And then, to her astonishment, tells her he would like his breakfast in bed the following morning with a couple of eggs. Fortunately, sleep claims him. And Molly is left alone with her thoughts, a great river of thoughts. A whole new style of writing. All the things he told father he was going to do. And me. But I saw through him. Telling me all the lovely places we could go for the honeymoon. Venice by moonlight with the gondolas. And the Lake of Como he had a picture cut out of some paper of. And mandolin and lanterns. Oh, how nice, I said. Whatever I liked, he was going to do immediately, if not sooner. Will you be my man? Will you carry my can? He ought to get a leather medal with a putty rim for all the plans he invents. Then leaving us here all day. They don't know what it is to be a woman and a mother. How could they? Where would all of them be if they hadn't all a mother to look after them? What I never had. I better not make an all night sitting on this affair. They ought to make chambers a natural size so a woman could sit on it properly. That dry old stick, Dr. Collins, for women's diseases. Asking me if what I did had an offensive odor and could you pass it easily? Pass what? I thought he was talking about the Rock of Gibraltar. Wait. Wait, there's George's church clock. Wait. Three quarters the hour. Wait. Two o'clock. Well, that's a nice hour of the night for him to be coming home at to anybody. He came somewhere, I'm sure, by his appetite, yes. Because he never did a thing like that before, as asked to get his breakfast in bed with a couple of eggs. Yes, because he couldn't possibly do without it that long. So he must do it somewhere. Anyhow, love it's not, or he'd be off his feet thinking of her. So either it was one of those night women, if it was down there he was, really. And the hotel story he made up. A pack of lies. And then the usual kissing my bottom was to hide it. Not that I care two straws who he does it with. Though I'd like to find out. I'll see if he has that French letter still in his pocketbook. I suppose he thinks I don't know. Deceitful men. All their twenty pockets aren't enough for their lies. He ought to give it up now at this age of his life. Simply ruination for any woman. No satisfaction in it. Pretending to like it till he comes. Then finish it off myself anyhow. Oh. 
and it makes your lips pale. Oh well, with all the talk of the world about it, people make it's only the first time. After that, it's just the ordinary do it and think no more about it. Why can't you kiss a man without going and marrying him first? I sometimes love to. Wildly. When you feel that way. So nice all over, you can't help yourself. Wish some man or other would take me sometime and kiss me in his arms when he's there. There's nothing like a kiss. Long and hot down to your soul. Almost paralyzes you. Then I hate that confession. When I used to go to Father Corrigan, he touched me father. And what harm if he did? Where, my child? And I sit on the canal bank like a fool. Unless I paid some nice young boy to do it. Since I can't do it myself. A young boy would like me. I'd confuse him a little. Alone with him if we were. I'd let him see my garters. The new ones. And make him turn red looking at him. Seduce him. Oh, I know what boys feel. With that down on their cheek. Doing that frigging. Drawing out the thing by the hour, question and answer. Would you do this, that, or the other? With the cold man? Yes. With the bishop? Yes, I would. <laughs> oh, even if it's the truth, I don't believe you. Oh, well. For the four years more I have of life, up to 35, no? What am I at all? I'll be 30. In September. Will I? What? Oh, well. Like some of them books he brings me. The works of Master Francois, somebody supposed to be a priest. Ruby and fair tyrants. I remember when I came up to page 50, the part where she hangs him up out of a hook with a cord. Flagellate. There's nothing for a woman in that. All invention. That's the kind of villainy they're always dreaming about. With not another thought in their empty heads. They ought to get slow poison, the half of them. I suppose I'm nothing anymore. When I wouldn't let him lick me. Well, he does it all wrong. Thinking only of his own pleasure. His tongue is too flat. I don't know what. I'll make him do it again if he doesn't mind himself. And then lock him down to sleep in the coal cellar with the black beetles. Wait, oh, Jesus. Oh, oh, that thing has come on me. Yes. Oh, and I wouldn't that afflict you. Of course, all the... Poking and plowing and rooting the boiling had up in me. Now what am I to do? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh, wouldn't that pester the soul out of a body? Unless he likes it. Some men do. God knows there's always something wrong with us. Five days every three or four weeks. Usual monthly auction. But the cat itself is better off than us. Have we too much blood up in us or what? Isn't it simply sickening? Anyhow, he didn't make me pregnant as big as he is. I don't want to ruin the clean linen. Damn it! They always want to see a stain on the bed. To know you're a virgin for them. Oh, that's troubling them. They're such fools, too. You could be a widow. Or divorced 40 times over. A dog of red ink would do. Or blackberry juice. Oh, that's too purpley. Oh, 
extremes he let me out of this. Sweets of sin. Whoever invented that business for women, what? Between clothes and cooking and children. This damned old bed, too. Jinkling like the dickens. I suppose they would hear us way over the other side of the park. I think he made them a bit firmer. Sucking them like that so long he made me thirsty. Titties, he calls them. At last. Yes. This one, anyhow. Stiff the nipple gets for the least thing. I'll get him to keep that up. I'll take those eggs. Beaten up with Marsala. Fatten them out for him. After all those veins and things. Curious the way it's made. Two the same. In case of twins. They're supposed to represent beauty placed up there. Like those statues in the museum, one of them pretended to hide it with her hand. <laughs> Aren't they so beautiful? Of course, compared with what a man looks like, with his two bags full, and his other thing hanging down out of him, or sticking up at you like a hat rack. No wonder they hide it with a cabbage leaf. A woman is beauty, of course, that's admitted. When he said, I could pose for a picture naked to some rich fella, would I be like that bath of the nymph? With my hair down. Yes, only she's younger. A little like that dirty bitch in that Spanish photo he has. The nymphs. Do they go about like that? I asked him. That disgusting Cameron Highlander behind the meat market. Or that other wretch with a red head behind the tree. Where the statue of the fish used to be. When I was passing, pretending he was pissing. Standing out for me to see it. Like some kind of a thick crowbar. He must have eaten oysters. They're always trying to show it to you. Every time nearly I passed outside the men's greenhouse near the station. Just to try. Some fellow or other trying to catch my eye. As if it was one of the seven wonders of the world. Oh, and the stink of those rotten places. The night coming home with Poldy after that party, I went into one of them. It was so biting cold I couldn't keep it. When was that? 93? The canal was frozen. I was in mourning. Yes, it was a few months after. Eleven years ago now. He'd be eleven. What was the good of going into mourning for what was neither one thing nor the other? Of course, he insisted. Well, he'd go into mourning for the cat. This one, not too much. There's the mark of his teeth still, where he tried to bite the nipple. I had to scream out. Aren't they fearful trying to hurt you? 
I had a great breast of milk with Millie. Enough for two. What was the reason of that? He said I could have got a pound a week as a wet nurse. All swelled out. Hurt me they used to, weaning her. I had to get him to suck them, they were so hard. He said it was sweeter and thicker than cows. Then he wanted to milk me into the tea. Well, he's beyond everything. I declare somebody ought to put him in the budget. If only I could remember the one half of the things and write a book out of it. The works of Master Poldy. Oh. So much smoother, the skin. Much. An hour he was at them, I'm sure, by the clock. Like some kind of a big infant I had at me. They want everything in their mouth. All the pleasure those men get out of a woman. Oh, I can feel his mouth. I gave my eyes that look. With my hair a bit loose from the tumbling and my tongue between my lips up to him. A savage brute. Friday one, Saturday two, Sunday three. Oh, Lord, I can't wait till Monday. I wished he was here. Or somebody to let myself go with. Come again like that. I feel all fire inside me. And he made me spend the second time. Tickling me behind with his finger. Oh, I was coming for about five minutes with my legs around him. Oh, Lord, I wanted to shout all sorts of things. Fucking shit. <gasps> awful deep down torrent. And the sea. The sea crimson sometimes. Like fire. And the glorious sunsets. And the fig trees in the Alameda Gardens, yes. And all the queer little streets and the pink and blue and yellow houses. And the rose gardens. And the jessamine. And geraniums and cactuses. And Gibraltar as a girl. Where I was a flower of the mountain. And when I put the rose in my hair, like the Andalusian girls used, or shall I wear a red? <laughs> and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, well, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again. Yes. And then he asked me, would I? Yes, to say yes, my mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me, yes, so I could feel my breasts all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad. Yes, I said. Yes, I will. Finnegan lived in Walken Street, a gentleman Irish mighty odd. He had a brogue both rich and sweet, and to rise in the world he carried a hod. Whack fal da da dance to your partners, wipe the floor, your trotter shake. <laughs> Isn't it the truth I told you? Lots of fun at Finnegan's wake. <laughs> uh, you ought to do more singing. You know, when Jim wrote his last book and called it Finnegan's Wake, it wasn't fun we had at all. Nearly drove us all mad. Have you read any of it, Mrs. Joyce? Finnegan's Wake? Indeed, I have not. 
have you? Sure, you'd need to be a walking dictionary to understand it. <laughs> what's the ball? What's the ball? The wickedly, lethally. She sideslipped out be a gap in the devil's glen while Sally, her nurse, was sound asleep in a sluice. And fee fee foy foy fell over a stillway before she found her stride and lay and wriggled in all the stagnant black pools of rainy under a fallow coo. The only one, apart from Jim himself, who could understand it at all was Harriet Shaw Weaver. She read the first few chapters and she decided straight off that Jim was a genius. Your husband seemed to have invented a whole new language. Oh, she kept the wolf away from our door over the years with her most generous gifts of money. Oh, thousands of pounds she must have given him. Do you see, she believed in Jim. Oh, and he could be a suspicious fellow when he liked. But he trusted Miss Weaver completely. She came to visit me last Christmas. One, I was very bad with the arthritis. <laughs> She sat right here in front of the fire, and we talked about Finnegan's Wake. Isn't it the truth I told you? Lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> Finnegan's Wake, such an extraordinary book. All the time he was writing it, he kept sending me endless notes of explanation, none of which proved the slightest help. Seeing as how it took him 16 years to write it, you must have been up to your knees in paper. I suppose I was. But what a daring experiment with language. Anna Livia Plurabel. Anna Livia. Now that was his name for the River Liffey. Oh, I think that's my favourite chapter. The gossiping Dublin washerwoman telling the story of that wonderful river, Anna Livia. Sure, he was always going on about the Liffey. It is on the banks of the Liffey we did our courting, you know. Well, perhaps that's what inspired Mr. Joyce to present the river in that way. First, as a young, shy girl, then as a woman, adorning herself for her lovers, and finally, old and tired, like us, yet full of life, flowing into Dublin Bay. You know, Jim loved to read that chapter out loud. I could never understand a word of it. Doesn't matter, he'd say. "'Tis not the sense but the sound which is important. "'The sound of the river." Go on, tell us. 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 <laughs> she was just a young, tin, pale, soft, shy, slim slip of a thing then, sauntering by Silver Moon Lake. And he was a heavy, trudging, lurching, lie abroad of a curlock man, making his hay for whose son to shine on. <laughs> you know the Dinkle Dale of Lugalaw? Well, there once dwelt a local heremite. Michael Arklow was his river end name. Oh, with many a sigh, I aspersed his lava bibs. And one venner Sturgeon, June or July. Oh, so sweet and so cool and so limber she looked. <laughs> Nance the Nixie, <laughs> Nano, let's go. In the silence of the sycamores, ah, listening, he plunged both of his newly anointed hands, the core of his cushlas, in her singamari saffron strumens of hair, parting them and soothing her and mingling it that was deep, dark and ample, like this red bog at sundown. <laughs> he could not help himself. <laughs> Thor so that hot on him. He had to forget the monk in the man. <laughs> so, rubbing her up and smoothing her down. <laughs> He based his lippies in a smiling mood. Kiss, kiss after kiss of Kushka on Anna and the Pogues of the freckled forehead. <laughs> oh, wasn't he the bold priest? <laughs> and wasn't she the naughty Livy? <laughs> Nautic namers know her name. And two lads in scouts' breeches went through her before that. Barefoot burn and wallamy wade. Lugna Quilia's no blessed picks <laughs> before she had a hint of a hair at her fanny died. <laughs> Or a bosom to tempt a bird canoodler. <laughs> Not to mention a bulging porterhouse barge. And ere that again, she was licked by a hound while pawing her pee. 
pure and simple on the spur of the hill in Old Kapur. What am I ransom now and I'll thank you. Is it a penny or is it a surplus? And where's the star? Ooh, ooh. May the Diablo twist your safety pin, you child of mammon. Pencil as Lilith. <laughs> now, who's been tearing the leg of her drawers on? Uh -huh. Oh, which leg is that? <laughs> the one with the bells on it. Where did I stop? So, she said to herself she'd frame a plan to fake a shine. Oh, oh the mischief maker, the like of a Geneva herd. Lend us your blessed ashes here till I scrub the cannon's underpants. <laughs> Blow now, our mower. And pooly pooly. First, she let her hair fall, and down it flussed to her feet, its teviots winding coils. Then she made her bracelets and her anklets and her armlets and her jetty amulet for necklace of clicking cobbles and pattering pebbles and rumble down rubble, Richmond and rare of Irish lunar rhiner stones <laughs> and shell marble bangles. <laughs> <laughs> that done, a dog of smut to her airy eye, Anushka Lutechevich Pavlova, <laughs> and the lily pos cream to her lepelines, <laughs> and the pick at the paint box for her pomets. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, as soon as the lump, his back was turned, with her mealy bag slung over her shoulder, and Olivia, oyster face, forth of her basin came. Everybody that saw her said the dose little Delia looked a bit queer. <laughs> ah, you've all the swiddles your side of the curtain. <laughs> She was a queer old scow shiny hole. Anna Livia, trinket toes. I'm sure he was the queer old bums too. Dear, dirty dumpling. <laughs> Fooster father of Fingals and Dotter Gills. Oh, Gammer and Gaffer were all their <laughs> gangsters. <laughs> the same I knew. Anna was. Livia's. Plural bells to be. <laughs> <laughs> Finnegan's week. Now that was the important book. Jim always said so, right up to the last. It will keep the professors puzzling for a thousand years, he'd say. And everybody else too with them jawbreakers of words. I always thought it was a very comical way of making money. Oh, I'll be dad, if I had a shilling today for everyone who'd said to me, well, I haven't read the books exactly themselves, Mrs. Jice, but I've read all about them. I'm sure I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> oh, and the books made a great deal of money in those years. What happened to it? I'm sure, I suppose we must have spent it. God, he was desperate, extravagant. And then there were all the medical bills, of course. Eleven major eye operations in the last eight years of his life. It would break your heart to see him trying to write and correct the proofs of Finnegan's wake. Sure, the man was next to blind. I had to go everywhere with him. I was like a nursemaid. You also acted as a nursemaid for your daughter, Lucia. Lucia didn't need a nursemaid. She was a young woman of 24 by then. Mrs. Joyce, your daughter has a serious mental illness. No, don't say that now, please. That's not true. Then why, Mrs. Joyce, has she been hospitalized for the past 11 years? No, you don't understand now. She's, she's very unmanageable. She was always nervous, highly strung. All those years of moving about Europe, like gypsies, different countries, different schools different languages. Her father spoiled her, and she worshipped him. But she was often violent with you. Well, only when she was terribly upset. She was young, and she was very gifted. And she was in love. With Alex Ponosovsky? No. She fell in love with a young writer who spent a good deal of time in our house. His name was Samuel Beckett. It is true she was engaged to Ponosovsky for a while, but that was an arranged match, if you like. When she was diagnosed and certified, your husband still refused to have her committed. He tried to treat her himself? He tried everything. 
We took her to doctors all over Europe, to clinics and specialists, even, even to the famous Dr. Jung. For eight years we tried to save her. Injections and cures and holidays and rest homes and presents. Oh, there was nothing he wouldn't do for her. And half the time his sight was so bad he couldn't even see her face. And even with Jim, sometimes she taunted him. Sometimes she was wild like an animal, snarling and screaming and spitting. Other times she would just stand still like a statue for hours, staring out the window with the evening star. Everybody, doctors, friends, even Georgia wanted him to have her committed, but he would not hope. He would not have her locked away in some asylum to be forgotten about because it terrified him. Suppose you'll want to know all about our famous friends. <laughs> all the interviewers want to know that. And what I thought of them all. <laughs> sure, when you've been married to the greatest writer in the world, you don't pay too much attention to the little fellas. I don't see too many of them anymore. When Jim and I left France in 1940 and moved here to Zurich, he was a very sick man. He had an ulcer that nobody knew of. He died a short time after. And the war changed a lot of things, you know. Many of the people that we knew went to America and the Nazis got a lot of the ones who stayed. Alex Ponosovsky. Lucia's young fiancé. He was picked up in one of the first Paris raids. He died in a concentration camp. There are still a few good friends, though. The Columns, Parik and Molly. They've been very kind to me. They send me a little money from time to time. I was just writing to them when you came in. If you'd like to wait in the other room, you can speak to my son, Georgia, when he gets back. He's just gone for a walk up by the cemetery. Jim's buried here, you know, right next to the zoo. He was always so fond of the lions. I like to think of them lying there, listening to them roar. Goodbye, Mrs. Joyce. Thank you. Good night. I'm afraid I shall sooner or later have to sell my manuscript of chamber music. Written in Dublin in 1909 and dedicated to me. It is written on parchment and bound in cream-coloured leather with the Joyce crest on one side of the cover and our initials on the other side. If you know anybody who you think would be interested in buying such a work, would you kindly let me know? With warmest... Thanks to you and Molly and with kind regards. Within a month of writing this letter, Nora Barnacle Joyce died of uremic poisoning 
brought on by the treatment of her arthritis by cortisone on April 10th, 1951. In the funeral speech at her graveside, the officiating Swiss priest described her as a great sinner.